Amen. All right, go ahead and be seated for a second. Question number two we're going to talk about today. We, last week we talked about what is the chief end of man. Why did God make us? That is to do what with God? Glorify God and do what? Enjoy Him forever. The second question has to do with what rule has God given us to direct us how we may glorify Him? So if God says and teaches us in His Word that our chief purpose for being here is to glorify Him and enjoy Him, how do we find out how to do that? Well, here's the answer. The Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures, the Old Testament, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, or the Law and the Prophets, then the New Testament, which is the Apostolic Scriptures. And notice, this is the only rule. This is the only place that God has directed us how we may glorify Him and enjoy Him. Right here. He doesn't tell us and say, I've created you for the purpose of glorifying me and enjoying me, and then tell us, you guys figure it out all on your own now. You guys try to just think of ways that you can glorify me and enjoy me. We It's kind of like uh, chocolate pie. I love chocolate pie. But if I never told anybody that I, I like chocolate pie, nobody would know it, would they? Especially Miss Teresa, that's right. Nobody would know it. So they wouldn't know what, what I brought. And what if, you know, there are some pies that I despise. And what if, you know, people just started bringing me those pies. But it's not their fault per se because they didn't know. I had to let someone know exactly what I delight in. God is the same way. He doesn't leave us to our own devices to figure out how to glorify him or how to enjoy him. He's given us his word. And this word is so important. This is, I mean, this, this, as Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We get in the scriptures to interact with God. We get in the scriptures not just to get information, you know, though we can glean information from it, but if that information doesn't result in transformation of our life, it's not doing us any good. And transformation of our life comes when we read in here how we can glorify him, how we can enjoy him forever. That's why spending time in the word of God each day and interacting with him through the scripture is so vital and so important. And he's given us the way to know him and given us the way to know what he delights in, what pleases him, also what grieves him, the things that are destructive to our own lives, the things that are offensive to him, so that we avoid those things so that with our lives we can glorify him and we can be led to enjoy him. And we, we only find pure joy and pleasure in our lives when we are doing what God created us to do. I was reading in Genesis 1 this morning how God created us in his image, and we talked about that last year, for the purpose of making him known in the earth. There was purpose in what he did in create, creating us and how that his blessing rested upon two forms of life. His blessing rested on the animals that he created on the land and in the sea and on mankind. And it says he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. Those are the two aspects of creation where it specifically says he blessed them. And the blessing had to do with them being fruitful, multiplying, and then with man there was one more thing, ruling. Letting God's rule be spread throughout all of the earth, bearing his image as they go, his, who he is and what he's like. And the way you do that is by glorifying him and enjoying him as we go through our lives. So we find out how to glorify and enjoy God in the word of God. Amen? All right. If you are, Bible's up to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. Last two weeks, we talked about the importance and the need for revival and spiritual awakening in our own personal lives, in the church, as well as in the nation. 
And the scripture, when we looked at some of these passages, one of the passages we looked at recently was in uh, the book of Corinthians where the Apostle Paul specifically talks about all of the things that were written in the law and the prophets, all of these things, he says, were written for our instruction. They were written to teach us things. And though we, uh, as God's people now, aren't, you know, a nation like Israel was, a nation, they went through a lot of experiences in their journey with God and to give us illustrations of spiritual truths. I mean, just for example, we can go back and we can look at the fact that they battled enemies and they had physical wars with real enemies. But we know in the New Covenant, when we look at that, we don't go out and battle physical enemies per se, you know, with weapons, but we do battle a spiritual enemy with weapons that are spiritual in nature. And we can learn principles of warfare by reading the experiences of Israel and how they did physical warfare, and we can learn principles of spiritual warfare from that. We can learn about God's provision, how he provided for them, and then we can learn and see that just as he provided for his people then, he provides for us now. So all the things that happened to them were happening as an example for us, Paul says, upon whom the end of the ages have come. So we learn things from them. That's why the Old Testament can become a very rich, rich wealth of information in our spiritual growth. In fact, for the early church, that's all she had. I mean, we know that the Scriptures as we know them today weren't finally, you know, categorized as such until about the 4th century. So, I mean, in the early days, yeah, they had some of Paul's letters floating around and some of Peter's letters and so forth, but... They didn't look at those or yet regard them in the sense of Scripture as we as they would have the Old Testament at that time. And so what they studied and how they learned how to walk with God, how to live in communion and fellowship with God, primarily came from their understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures. So there is a wealth of information there. And the and and the 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 principles that are there that are laid out give us a picture as well of spiritual journey, journeys that individuals take and the highs and lows in that journey, as well as spiritual journeys that nations take. In fact, a lot of the things that Jesus had to say to his, and his final words spoken or written that were written for us in the book of the Revelation to his church, much of what was drawn in those admonitions and corrections and rebukes to those churches were drawn from the Old Testament and the experiences of God's people there. When we get into a place where we understand that we know we need revival and we need spiritual awakening, you don't arrive in that place overnight. You don't get there instantly to where you're from. you were here and now all of a sudden you're down here. It is a downward spiral. And sometimes that downward spiral can be very subtle. It can happen collectively with nations. It can happen individually with churches. It can also happen to us personally in our own lives. How many scriptures in the New Testament are admonitions to us to guard our hearts To guard our minds, we're warned about the dangers of drifting away. You know, when you're on a boat, and if you're not, you know, securely anchored and moored somewhere, it's very easy when you're caught up with all other activities on that boat not to be paying attention and suddenly find yourself a long way off from where you originally were, simply carried away very quietly, very subtly by the tide and by the current. If you've ever been swimming at the beach and there's been strong currents, you know you can go in one spot and you're out there just enjoying yourself, having a great time, and then you look up and you realize you've already, you know, you floated down 100 yards from where you went in. You weren't paying attention. You were just enjoying yourself out there, getting some sun, swimming, whatever you were doing. But all of a sudden you realize you've been carried way down the beach without realizing it. 
And the same thing is true in this whole idea of drifting away from God where you get to a place and a point where you are all of a sudden in desperate need of revival and spiritual awakening and find yourself in a very sometimes dire place, dire straits in our lives and collectively as a people. This passage in Deuteronomy was a song that was sung. Moses was the singer. And he sang this song for Israel, and what this song had to do with was their future. He was given a song by the Lord to prophesy what was going to happen to them down the road and how they would be, how things would transpire for them as a nation and as a people, where they would end up, and then, of course, God's gracious rescue of them. They, at that time, could not fathom themselves ever being in such a place. Could not imagine. Because they, they were getting ready to go in the promised land. They had a whole new generation of people now. All those people that had not believed God, 20 years up, old and older, that generation, generation before who had doubted God and everything, they were dead. Now we got a new generation of vital people who have seen God do things. We're ready to go. We're ready to go in this land. We're ready to possess this land that God's given us. We're ready to drive these enemies out, claim this land, live in this land flowing with milk and honey, live in covenant relationship with God. This is going to be the greatest time in our history and yet Moses sings this song and in this song he's giving them a future peak into their experiences down the road and it was hard for them to fathom this and so as we begin we'll begin in in verse 9 and uh it's here it begins as as uh he's already talking about God's goodness and, and and greatness toward them and it says for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the apple or pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings. He caught them, carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him. There was no foreign God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth and ate the produce of the field. He made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats with the finest of the wheat and the blood of grapes. You drank wine. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You were grown fat and thick and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. They made him jealous with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they've not known, new gods who came lately whom your fathers did not dread. And you neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and spurned them. Because of the provocation of his sons and daughters, then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. They've made me jealous with what is not God. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and it burns to the lowest part of Sheol. And consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction. And the teeth of beasts I will send upon them with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Outside the sword will be reeve and inside terror. Both young man and virgin, the nursling and the man of gray hair. I would have said... I will cut them to pieces. I will remove the memory of them from men had I not feared the provocation by the enemy that their adversaries would misjudge, that they would then say, Oh, our hand is triumphant, and the Lord has not done all of this. For they are a nation lacking in counsel, and there's no understanding in them. Would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern 
their future. Then he goes on talking about more of the plight of the people. Just in this section alone, God gives us a picture of spiritual declension. You start here, and then you end up down here. But it is a decline that is gradual over time, because it would take Israel some time for the future, after the death of Joshua, that they would begin this spiral in earnest. We begin to see it really transpiring and beginning the snowball, as it were, rolling down the hill in the book of Judges. And every man beginning to do that which was right in his own eyes, rather than what God wanted them to do. And this declension would go down, and then they'd have a little time of, you know, a peak of restoration for 40 years or so, and then they'd go down again, and then they'd go down again. And then along comes, you know, prophets that God begins to send them, and then collectively as a nation, things just progressively continue to get worse. They, again, they have a few little peaks here and there, but it's still downward until ultimately these people are led away into captivity, both the northern and the southern kingdom, just as God said they would be because of them drifting and turning away from him. So what is this downward progression? What does it look like? You know, how, can we, how can we see the steps and avoid them in our own life? And there are a couple of very simple things that we can do to protect our hearts and to protect our own personal lives from entering into any kind of declension like this. But there's also one answer. There is the answer for collectively churches and nations to be recovered from such a spiritual decline. But the first thing we have to understand is what God tells them in verses 9 through 12. You were a picked people. You were chosen. You were a special group of people. So, you know, you get this first picture. God tells them, look, I picked you out. I chose you. And he tells them, he says, you know, God looked down, and even though all these other nations prior to this in verses 7 and 8, he talks about, you know, these nations being scattered, there was one nation, God says, that he set his eyes upon and he set his heart upon, and that was Israel. He says, for the Lord's portion, his inheritance is Israel. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He picked them. It says he found them in a desert land in the howling waste of a wilderness. Notice, God is the one who found them. They did not find him. They were not looking for him, were they? He found them. Just in the same way as Jesus tells us, you did not choose me, I chose you. You didn't seek me, I came seeking you. The Son of Man was sent to seek and to save that which was lost, because that which was lost was not seeking him. And so Israel was chosen and picked out by God, and God came looking for them, but they were not in a good place. He tells them, you were in a desert land, in a howling waste of a wilderness. You were in a bad place when I came looking for you, when I chose you. You were not in a good way. Just like we, as individuals, were not in a good way when Jesus came seeking us, we were lost. We were lost in sin. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were in the howling waste and wilderness of sin, slaves, captives to the evil one, condemned. We were in a very, very bad way. And Jesus came seeking us just like he came seeking Israel in their howling desert land and the waste places. Then it says that he cared for them and he provided for them. He says he found them in this desert land, the howling waste, and he encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil, the apple of his eye. And he says that like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and he caught them and he carried them on his pinions. God is given a picture here. You know, you're protecting the pupil literally of your eyes, what he's talking about when we're talking about the apple of the eye. I mean, we're very careful to guard our eyes, aren't we? We don't, you know, any kind of dust or anything. We, we, we don't want anything to get in our eyes because of the what it causes pain. 
And God is, when he's guarding his people, he's protecting them like the pupils of your eye. He's very careful about shielding them from danger, from harm. And they, they, as long as they, they were willing to listen to him and to stay under his protective nurture and care. And then, of course, he carries them on his wings. He, he's like a mother eagle, and he's drawing some illustration from nature. And although you've got some ornithologists who say, see, the Bible's not true because it talks about eagles carrying their young on the wings, and they don't do that. Well, it has been observed a few times when little fledglings were out flying and they were tired that mothers would carry them and let them rest on the shoulders in between their wings. But what God is doing here is he's using a, a picture of, simpler, of you simply illustrating He cares. He carried them when they could not carry themselves. He hovered over them and and held them underneath the shadow of his wings. He protected them. He guided them. And it says there was no foreign God with him. There was exclusivity in their relationship with him. It was God and Israel, Israel and God. They were passionately, deeply in love with one another, devoted to one another, caring for one another. God picked her and chose her. He cared for her and he provided for her. And you know what flowed from that relationship? The second thing is this. They were prospered in a big way. Prosperity flowed to them as a nation. In verses 13 and 14, notice what it says. He made him ride on the high places of the earth. He ate the produce of the field. He made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock. What that is, that is that well, you don't get honey from a rock and oil from a flinty rock. But the idea there, again, it's a metaphor saying even the places that were difficult, I made them abundant for you. I made things sweet for you. The hard places, the flinty places, the the sharp places, I turned those around and it was like oil, smooth oil flowing from those places. I prospered you as a nation. I blessed you. Man, you had the curds of cows, milk from the flock, fat of lambs, rams, the breed of Bashan, goats, the finest of the wheat, the blood of grapes, you drank wine. Man, you were prospering like nobody else on the face of the earth. I prospered you. And he did. They would go into that land, and God, their fields would produce. I mean, he'd even told them, look, on the seventh year, which was a Sabbath year, and you're not going to be able to plow the land, then the eighth year you'd have to plant again, and you couldn't harvest till the ninth. I'll make sure you've got plenty to take care of the seventh, eighth year, all the way into the ninth. You'll never lack, and they didn't. In their early time with God, they didn't lack anything. They had abundance. I mean, Israel was known then by the other nations of this this massive, fruitful, prospering, wealth, riches. They had it all. God was blessing them immensely and abundantly. He prospered them in a great, great way. The same is true for us. God picks us, he chooses us, he cares for us, he nurtures us, he guides us, he directs us, he shields us, and he also prospers us. Paul the Apostle tells us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. That he who is rich became poor so that we might become rich and wealthy in him. Not necessarily in material, physical things per se, but in spiritual matters. But even at that, even at that, You can look throughout history and see that every single culture where the gospel has penetrated has taken that culture and lifted it up. It has prospered it, not only spiritually, but there's also been material, economic, social, relational, familial prosperity that has come to those nations who made God their God and tried to live according to his ways. God prospered them. God protected them. God gave them favor. You can look at the same thing is true for us as a nation, isn't it? We, with the exception of our nation, we went through these, you know, this barren period at the beginning, but committed to God, and God began to cause this nation to flourish. He began to give her success. 
We'd have a time of decline, but then revival would come. As we saw a few weeks ago, these cyclical events of revival would take place. And then, and each, in between each cycle, you study this historically, in between each cycle, the nation prospered a little bit more. And a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, after the 1859 revival, you enter, obviously, there was the war between the states, but then there was this reconstructive period and all. It was a very hard time for people in the south, very prosperous time for people in the north. But then all of a sudden, this prosperity then began to spread throughout the country. And you go into this century, and you're, there's, this, there's this wealth now of knowledge that's starting to develop, industry that's starting to develop, intellectual discovery that's starting to develop, scientific discovery that's starting to be developed, and this nation begins to flourish and prosper, that it begins, to, it begins now to be like the nation on the planet. All of a sudden, people are leaving all their countries all over the world to come where? Here. Because this was the most prosperous place on the planet. Then, of course, you know, we had that little time, you know, we had World War I and then the what? The roaring 20s. Again, a great time of prosperity. Then we had this, a slump of time of the Depression. Again, these little slumps and these things that happened in history were God's promptings, were God's voice sending waves of wake-up call to repent and return. But we didn't listen. We come out of that in his grace. We come out of that, and then over for the rest of the 20th century, this nation explodes in prosperity. Just explodes. Just explodes. Now, Israel, when God blessed her with that, there's one key, one key that would have saved her. One simple word, and it produces something. What's that? Gratitude. You know what gratitude does? It keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. Knowing where every good and perfect gift comes from. But Israel didn't do that. Israel wasn't grateful. Nor was America. Nor was America grateful. What happened? The next step. Pride. It says in verse 15, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grown fat, thick, and sleek. Prospered, you're, you're just like a big fat bubble. You know, you had it all. When my parents lived in Florida, they used to have one of those, what do they call those pot belly pigs, those huge pigs. I mean, that pig couldn't hardly get up. So fat and so heavy. Feed him, oh, constantly, constantly feeding that pig, you know. And that pig couldn't do anything. It was just laying in the mud and the muck and all that stuff, just soaking up the sun. But it was huge. You couldn't do anything. Had all that he needed, all that he wanted. Just your one grew fat and grew thick, God said, and sleek. But he began to kick. He began to get proud, puffed up. I did this at my hand. Look at me. This is my doing. I made myself prosper. We made ourselves prosperous. And then it says when they got into this place of pride, it says they had basically, they're, they're like, I have no need now for God because look at what I've got. Look at my prosperity. Like I'm rich. And increased with goods and have need of nothing, not even you, God. Do you know that's what they were saying, the church at Laodicea? They thought they were so prosperous, they had need of nothing, and that included Jesus. I don't need anything. Look at us. Look what we've done. Look where we are. Look at how prosperous we are. They had religious actions. They were going through religious motions, but no heart. 
no relationship with Jesus. He had been excluded by them and pushed out. They didn't need him. They could operate without him. They were no longer dependent upon him or grateful. And when that happened, when that pride entered in, when that pride entered in, it led to something very, very, very bad. These are all P's so you can remember them easier, okay? It led to perversion. Something drastic happened in their heart. And it says, then, then, in that place of pride and being puffed up and arrogant, he forsook God who made him. Notice, this now is at a point where it is a deliberate turning now. It is a forsaking. They are deliberately turning away from God and leaving him. Because in their mind, they don't need him anymore. They leave him, and not only did they forsake him, it says that they scorned, they scorned or they lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They literally, this, this, this word in the Hebrew means to account something or someone as vile. As vile. To despise. They forsook him and scorned him. How could that happen? How could that happen? How could they view God that way? In the midst of all that he'd done for them, how could they walk away from him? How could they treat him as vile and evil and bad and scorn him and take no account of him and literally despise him? Do you know that can happen in an individual's life? When we begin to drift away from God and we get proud and we get puffed up and we think we don't need God, and then we begin to treat him with contempt. Our attitude is, I don't need God anymore. And then we start believing lies of the enemy. We start seeing God in a negative light. God's a bad thing for me. If I turn back to God, I might have to give up some of this stuff that I'm enjoying now, that I like now. I might have to turn away from some of it. I don't want to do that. Or collectively, just like Israel, as a nation, America has done the same thing. We treat God as vile now. He's an anathema. We want him out of our schools. We want him out of our courtrooms. We want him out of our political situations. We want to scratch and remove every representation of him from our culture and society. We want him taken out of our school books. We want him taken out of our history books. We want him removed. He's vile. He's contemptible. We don't want his laws ruling over us anymore. We don't want his standards ruling over us anymore. We want to do what we want to do because we are the ones that prospered ourselves. We don't need God. We're God. And we treat God as vile and contemptible because the pride has put us in that place. And we become puffed up. There's no need of him anymore. That pride then led to them doing this. This perversion, this perversion led them to provoke him. And they provoked him specifically, specifically in two ways. They provoked him. He's going to tell them exactly how. They provoked him. The first one he tells them, They provoked him with idolatry. They provoked him with idolatry. It says they made him jealous in verse 16 with strange gods. And when God's talking about jealousy here, it's not that (coughs) from a standpoint we think of human jealousy in a negative light. It's an idea of He is protective over us and over his people from anything that would do destruction or hurt to us. 
because he knows. So he's very jealous over us in that sense. And now what Israel has done is they have forsaken that, and now they've turned to other gods where he alone was to be the one they were in love with. Now they have become adulterers spiritually and have now fallen in love with other deities, other gods. They have committed the one sin that God warned them not, idolatry. And notice they're strange gods. They're unfamiliar. They're, they're, not, they're not gods at all from the standpoint of being God. But they, they provoked him. It's, it, it's kind of like when Moses was at, you know, up on the mountain with God for all of that time and down at the base of the mountain, Aaron's building this, you know, idol and everything and the people are partying and dancing in front of this idol and up here on the mountain is God's fiery presence and right at the base of it, they're like right in his face. Worshiping a, a false god. As if we don't care whether you see it or not. This is the God who brought us out. This cow. And they provoked him. It's like they were just thumbing their nose at God. Because they had no concern for what he thought anymore because their pride led them to that place. They provoked him with idolatry to strange gods. And then the second way he says they did it with abominations. Abominable things they began to do. This is a progressive thing. Whenever your pride turns you away from God, you're always going to be turned to some false god. Always. Because man has to have something to worship because man was created to be a worshiper. So he's going to worship something. If it's not the true God, it's going to be a false god. And that, that, that idol could be anything. It could be material things. It could be individuals. It could be, you know, it could be status or it can be literally another God. But we are always turned to, we're always turned away. That pride will turn us to idolatry, and that idolatry then will lead us to begin to practice and proliferate abominable things in our life. What kind of abominations had God warned Israel about and did they get into? Again, remember as we started out this morning, where do we find out how to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? In His Word. Where do we find out what's abominable to him in his word? So, look over real quick into the book of Leviticus chapter 20. He's already spelled this out for them, and these are exactly what they began to do. Leviticus chapter 20. Begin in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of his offspring his seed, his children, so as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Molech so as not to put him to death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut off the people from among their people, both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Molech. This is the first thing. The first way God, because this whole list of abominations, the first thing God says that happens in a nation and a people that turn away from him because of pride is their idolatry leads to the abomination of sacrificing their babies to other gods. Murdering innocent children. That's the first step. God hates that. He hates it. We can see that in our society, can't we? Our big step when we said we're, we want to despise God, we're going to write him out of our laws and we're going to determine in our own eyes what is life and what is not and who's allowed to live and who is chosen to die. 
and we'll begin to take the blood of the innocents. And we'll murder babies. So we've murdered 60, 70 million of them now over these years. God hates that. But it is a sign of the abominations a nation begins to practice when they turn away from God. Then he goes on and says in verses 6 through 8, As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I'll also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The next step is occultism. An abomination of occultism. Spiritism. Worshiping that other realm and the God of that other realm. Sometimes openly and blatantly, sometimes unbeknowingly. Well, I'll just check my you know, astrological chart today. See what my, astrologer ha- my astrology, my sign has to say what's going to happen to me in my life today. And again, this is proliferated in our culture. Spiritism, witchcraft, all of those things. All things that pertain to the occult. And one of the biggest things that pertain to the occult and occult practices in the book of Revelation is said to be pharmakia drugs altered states of consciousness that drugs produce that open up all kinds of avenues in your mind and in your life for the enemy to infiltrate you personally so there's the murder of children occultism and spiritism that begins to be proliferated Verse 9 says, if there is anyone who curses his father and his mother, he shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood guiltiness is upon him. Now there is rebellion that begins to take place in the family. Rebellion against parents, against authority. Parents in rebellion against God who mistreat and abuse their children. The family structure begins to collapse. Because again, we're not going to do it God's way. We're going to do it our way. And so a spirit of rebellion comes into the society and it begins to manifest in the family because the enemy knows once you destroy that fundamental foundational building block of mom and dad in a home raising children, and, prosp- and, 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 and being fruitful and multiplying. Once you do that, you then have set in motion the collapse of that society. You've set it in motion. Every empire in history that fell, one of the main reasons why it did was because the family structure was obliterated as God ordained it to be. Rebellion begins to take place in the family. Verses 10 through 17 When rebellion is taking place, when you have a spirit of occultism that's proliferating a society where children are being murdered and offered up, as it were, to other gods, then you have sexual perversion and impurity that comes in. If there's a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer, the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If there's a man who lies with his father's wife, he's uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be put to death. They have committed incest. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there's a man who marries a woman and her mother, it is immorality. Both he and they shall be burned with fire, so there will be no immorality in your midst. If there's a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You shall also kill the animal. If there's a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there's a man who takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, so that he sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace, and they shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of their people. He's uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he bears his guilt. And he goes on. Sexual perversion then begins to run rampant. In a society. And of course, you can go back culturally and sociologically and look at this nation. What were the 70s known for? They call it the, in the late 60s, the sexual revolution. What is a revolt? It is revolting against what has been the norm. 
what has been accepted and what has been the standard. Now we're going to revolt and go against that. And we're going to do what we want. And he lists all of these different things, all the way from you know, the, the adultery that went on to homosexuality and lesbianism to bestiality, which you, you would be shocked at how much of that goes on in this country. The perversion of it. All kinds of incestual relationships that are going on. Rape. The, all of, that is what begins to proliferate in a society when you have forgotten God and spurned him and treated him as a vile thing. And you turn your back on him. Moses is telling Israel. And again, Paul draws from this same, same thing. Same thing. Real quick, look over in Romans, Romans 1, and we've got a couple of passages we'll look at before we close. Look at Romans 1. <laughs> and lest you think, ooh, man, this is not good. There's some good news coming, okay? Romans 1. When they, when Paul describes, Paul is drawing, again, remember, Paul's source of authority was the law and the prophets. His understanding of how God operated and, and, and functioned. Now, again, you think, are we, does God want us to kill these people, you know, like he said? Jesus gave us some more insight into that and how we deal with that. The, 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 the issue is kill the sin, not the sinner. Kill the sin, not the sinner, because there is hope. If the sinner will see the error of their ways and repent, there's always grace to restore, no matter what they've done. Paul sees this, and, and, and God makes himself known. Verse 20 of Romans 1, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that have been made, so that they are without what? There's no excuse. Nobody can say, I'm sorry, I didn't know. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Oh, my goodness, what is this? They forsook him and spurned him. Or did they give thanks? Pride, no gratitude. But they became process, futile in their speculations and imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark. Process. What happened then? Processing them, professing themselves to be wise. We don't need God. We did this on our own. They became what? Paul says, fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, four footed animals, and crawling creatures. Idolatry. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Sexual perversion. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function of that which is unnatural. And in the same way also their men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, forsaking and treating him as vile, God gave them over, took his hands off basically to a depraved mind, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, Evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they don't only do them, but they give hearty approval. Literally, they applaud to those who practice them. They stand back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's keep committing that abomination. Let's keep, let's cheer on those abominable people doing those abominations before God. Let's cheer on the perversion. Let's cheer on the murder of children. Let's cheer on these vile practices. Yes, let's applaud them and let's do more of it. Sound like any society you know? And this is a sign of God saying, 
taking my hands off. You're running on your own now, boys and girls, and you are going to run into a brick wall. Because I picked you, I prospered you and blessed you, but you became proud, and you turned away from me. You turned away from me and wanted to do it on your own, and then you began to have idolatry and perversion, and all of these things manifest them. I've taken my hands off, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's go back real quick. We'll close Deuteronomy 32. In between each of these cycles, and you, historically, you go back and look at Judges, look at the prophets, all of that, there's always something very, very key. There is always this from God. There's always a plea to come home. There's always an open door and a prophet standing in front of that door saying, Israel, Papa's calling you home. Repent. Come home to him. Turn away from your sin. Don't keep going in this direction. You are going to lead yourselves to ruin if you keep going this way. Come home. Come home. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to heal you. He's ready to prosper you. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent of their sins... I will hear their prayer. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Please come home. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. If you only knew the time of your visitation and I wanted to gather you under my wing like a chicken gathers her little chicks under her wing, but you would not. You wouldn't come back. Repent and do the first works so that you don't lose your candlestick. There's always a plea. There's always a plea to us personally. God always woos and calls us by His Spirit. Come back. It it doesn't matter how much of this perversion you've fallen into. It doesn't matter all of the things you do. I'll, I'll heal you. I'll forgive you. I have more grace than you can even imagine to cover your sin and take care of you and heal you and restore you. I want you to back home. I don't want you to ruin your life. I don't want you to destroy yourself. I do not want that. That is not my best for you. It's not what I desire of you. But Israel wouldn't listen when the police came. And look what happens. Verse 19. Look what happened. The Lord saw this and spurned them. Because of the provocation of his sons and daughters, then he said, I will hide my face from them. That's blessing. I'll turn away. I will see what their end will be. Basically, he's saying, just like Paul in Romans 1, I take my hands off and let's see where they end up. Their perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness, They've made me jealous with what is not God. They've provoked me to anger with their idols. So I'll make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Do you know that scripture is used in the New Testament of God turning to the Gentiles with the gospel? Because Israel rejected their Messiah. Let, look what it led Israel to do ultimately. Where, where their perversion and their turning from God led them to. It led them to kill the God who created them. It led them to murder him. That's how contemptible they felt of him. We will eradicate you and kill you. And they took his only beloved son and murdered him. And God says, okay, I'll turn and I'll provoke you to jealousy with the people who were not my people. And he turned to the Gentiles. He says, I will bring, uh, my fire is kindled and my anger burns to the lowest part of Sheol and consumes the earth with its shield and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine, consumed by plague. Okay, economic catastrophes, diseases coming, bitter destruction, teeth of beasts I will send upon them, the venom of crawling things in the dust. That can be spiritual and physical. Nature basically turning against them as well as the demonic. Outside, the sword will bereave. You'll be bereaved by enemies and other nations attacking you 
and inside will be terror. You will constantly be living in fear within the borders of your own nation. Constant fear. Fear porn all over the media today, isn't it? Don't go out. Don't leave your house. Don't go here. Don't go there. You might get something that will kill you. Fear. Fear those people come in your nation. They're going to blow up buildings. Terror within. The sword without. Both young man and virgin, nursling and man of gray hair. Basically, nobody is excluded from all this. I would have said, I'll cut them in pieces. I'll remove the memory of them from men had I not feared the provocation of the enemy. Basically, God's saying, I would have just taken Israel and said, I'm done with you. But if I'd done that, nations that were doing all these things to them, they'd said, hey, we did this. God didn't do that. We did pride. He said, no, I won't do that. In verse 28, for they're a nation lacking in counsel. And there's no understanding in them. Oh, I wish that they were wise and understood this, that they would discern their future. I wish that they would pay attention and see where all this is leading them to. And wake up. Thus again the plea. Where are you headed? Look where you're going and wake up. Folks, the answer, the answer, the answer, the answer starts with me and you. The answer starts with us saying, God, start with me. Start with my life. Revive me. Heal my heart. Restore me. Me, 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 Lord. I can find plenty of logs out there in people's eyes. I can. But start with me. I want to be able to see clearly. I'm, I'm missing the, the log in my own eye. I want to you start with me, God. I can see what's going on in society, which is a, it's, it's, a, it's obviously we're sick. We're sick. We need your healing. We need your healing. God's ready to give the counsel. I counsel you, as he told Laodicea, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. White raiment, eyes that you can see. I'm counseling you. Would that they would listen to my counsel, he says. They don't know where they're headed. They don't see the brick wall they're getting ready to hit. And when they hit that brick wall, it is going to be bad. And it was. Oh, it was. They still, honestly, to this day, haven't recovered from hitting that brick wall. The key and the answer is turning back to him. We need to be praying for that for our nation, amen? We need to be praying that for others, for people that are caught up in a lot of these things that we see, the sins that he lists. Praying for God to rescue them and save them because he's grace. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. There is more than enough grace to cover any evil out there, period, and restore and heal. And we serve a God who wants to do that. Because he loves us. He doesn't want to see us ruined. Amen. Father, as we close this morning, we know that we can see the principles there in your word so clearly defined for us. Help us as a people to pray. To pray for our nation, for the people in our nation, for our neighbors, but first and foremost for ourselves, that we would be where you want us to be, walking with you each day, delighting in you, because you do not desire, the word says, the death of a sinner. You don't desire that, but that they may turn from their sin and live. Oh, forgive us where we have turned away from you. Be merciful to us, Father, and heal our land heal our land. In Jesus' name.